Today, I'm thrilled to introduce a friend, a source of inspiration for me, and a remarkable leader who has founded companies and invented products that dramatically improved our lives in the past 20 years. He recently published a book to give back, to mentor younger generations, and build communities and ideas beyond himself. So let's welcome Tony Fadell, the iPod inventor, iPhone co-inventor, Nest founder, Future Shape principal, and the author of Build, a New York Times and a Wall Street Journal bestseller. Tony, welcome to Oceanside Chat. Helen, it's great to be here. I, you know, we have, have so much history of working together and doing so many great things. It's great to be back together, gonna to be able to chat about those things and, and, and see what's, help, help your audience. I'm looking forward to it. Awesome. Tony, I have saved a question for you. So if you had to delete all but three apps from your iPhone, which one would you keep? If I, if, if, what would be the three apps I would keep? Yeah. Hmm. Wow, that's really hard. Um, <laughs> it would, the communications would be between either WhatsApp or email. Mm -hmm. um, I have to have a web browser. Mm -hmm. If I don't have a web browser, I don't have that. And then the third thing would either be Spotify or FIP, F-I-P. And that's, oh. a, I think, the best radio station. No, I keep Spotify because FIP is part of Spotify. So I would keep Spotify. So it would be a communications tool, a browsing tool, and a music tool. Those would be the three things I have to have. Wow. You see how much our life has integrated, right, to this device right. that you have co-invented. <laughs> That's how much I'm saying dramatically changed our life. You know? As uh, expected, you made a bestseller list for both the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. So now the success for your first book is official. What is your happiness level on a scale of one to 10? 10 being <laughs> the happiest. My happiness level? You know, I'm, I just, the nature of who I am, I think my happiness level, the, the high it ever can be is about seven or eight. Sometimes it's 10, not very often, but most of the time it's seven or eight. And so I feel pretty happy. I'm very tired. This is, you know, this, this book stuff is uh, very different from the stuff we usually do together. So uh, I'm, I'm still learning that, but uh, no, it's great. No, I can't be, you know, to tell you the truth, to, to be able to take my first time at bat with a book um, and be able to do uh, as well as it's done. And, you know, it was very nerve wracking because I had never done something like this before. Um, I can now breathe easier. You know, uh, I, we hold ourselves to higher standards, right, Ellen? And yeah. because of that, you know, I had big, um, I was nervous, but also high expectations for the book in terms of being sure it was quality. And so, but you don't know what quality means when you haven't done it previously. So uh, it becomes a real nail, nail biter, but so far so good. So yeah, uh, we'll, we'll keep it rolling. You have done a lot of impossible stuff in the past, you know, but if you're thinking about this, writing the book and publish the book and get cut all the way come to this point, um, like how difficult and challenged this is compared to everything you have done before. <laughs> well, the first thing is, is my name is on it. Right. Yeah. The other things had obviously it was a, I was behind the scenes. My name was in was inside of it, but not on it. So that was one another big thing. The other one, it was a much smaller team. It still takes a team, but it was a much smaller team than what we've done before. And you know, um, but uh, it was definitely different. And the biggest difference for me was that in the things that we create, you can usually uh, update that in the field. In other words, when a customer has it, you can change it with software or what have you, accessorize it. In this case, you get one chance and one chance only, and it better be right. And you don't really get a lot of changes changes to it afterwards. Uh, not like what we would normally understand it changes mm -hmm. to be. So, so yeah, to really know when you're done. Um, I've never had to be done with a product before. This I had to actually be done, right? And say, pen down. And uh, mm -hmm. so that was that was definitely new for me, but uh, so far so good. That's a very, very interesting perspective. You know, I read the entire book within a few days and loved uh -huh. it. 
Thank so you. needless to say, right, your life is full of surprises. <laughs> and you also tell memorable stories in the book, including your first startup of selling eggs to your neighbors. How old were you back then? Let's see, that was in third grade in Rochester, New York, or actually Pittsburgh, New York, near Rochester, where Kodak, where, you know, the, where Kodak was everything in the 70s, 60s, 70s. So uh, I was there and I was in third grade and the eggs would come one day a week. And my brother and I with our blue wagon would go for, and he is my younger brother. He, we would go from door to door and, uh, you know, uh, have a t hard time making change. <laughs> you know, you someone would buy them and then we didn't always have all the change and they would just give us the money. So that was fun because it was like little kids were showing up with eggs and they'd give us money and we, you know, and that was fun. It was really fun to have money in your hand and you could do things that your parents couldn't say no to. Like, I have money. I'm going to go buy that candy I wanted. No, you can't. Well, this is my money. I guess they're like, well, I guess. That's what you can do. So that was very much empowering, right? Was one is that you could go out and do something. And then two, you get, you know, money for that. And then you have control or agency over your life at the age of, let's see, I was eight, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Eight years yeah. old, uh, eight years, nine years old, something like that. And so, you know, that's pretty powerful. I think about that and my daughter's now eight. So, you know, I know she gets that. How do I make money? She asked me each day, <laughs> how can I make money? Yeah. Wow. That's a, that's a young age to be in charge of a business and the money, you know, and the freedom. <laughs> business in quotes, but yeah, it worked. <laughs> you know, there, it, sometimes it's easier when you're younger to start businesses because a lot of people just go, oh, that's so cute. <laughs> yeah. It gets yeah, a lot that harder. Definitely when you helps. Older. Right. Yeah. <laughs> So after more than well, 40 years, right? So what current fact about your life would most impress your nine-year-old self? Wow, look at these deep questions. Um, <laughs> I'm prepared, what Tony. Fa what fact? <laughs> yeah. um, I think it was... I think the fact is not listening to what everybody else told you to do. But I, I, I listened to what my gut and my brain told me what to do, right? Um, was finding your own path and not thinking that there was one way to doing what you wanna do um, because there is no such formula. You know, everybody looks for formulas. You have to understand that all of these things, and this is also in the book, are opinion-based decisions. And when it comes to you and what you're going to do with your life, it's your opinion that matters. Not everybody, not your parents, not anyone else. It's about what you want to do. And ultimately, longer term, it's going to be about your family and the choices you make for them as well. But early on, before you have a family and it's you, it's all about you. And you need to, you know, make sure you understand what you want to do and do it your way and learn from that. And don't be afraid of failure. Mm. Yeah, I love that part of the book as well, you know, whether it's data driven, it's opinion driven, right, when you make decisions, and it's always hard for people to make decisions, regardless your age, and then, you know, this is the first time actually I, I, I thought this is a very logical way to thinking about it. is a more data driven, opinion driven, or most of the time, like you mentioned in the book, you need both. You need both, but you have to understand which way, you know, when you're doing something new and the world's never seen it before, there is no data you can collect. You can get insights or something, but if you're doing something truly new and different, you can't get the data until after you've created it with the right, you know, hopefully with the right ideas, show it to the world, get data, and then refine from there. Most companies, most people, want some formula. They want something to tell them it's going to be success. You know, it's easier with V2 and V3 because those are evolutions, but revolutions, nothing exists like that. And, you know, people spend a lot of money um, trying to get other people to turn opinions into data so that they look like they're making a data-driven decision when it truly is an opinion-based decision. Like when they hire management consultants to turn this thing into data so that they can say, these people said it is, so therefore it's true, which is just their opinion as well, which is, you know, 
I think we're all, we get programmed that, and I have to say, because you're in school, right? I think we get programmed that there's a formula. I study these things, I get this data, and then I take this test, and if I, and I can pass the test if I have the data. Life isn't like that. There's no formula, there's no test, there's nothing like that for you to go walk through. And, and failure in school is bad. Failure in life is the only way you learn, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that uh, in some ways, while schooling is great and is necessary, you also have to understand that the method necessarily of learning is not always the, is not gonna be the way that you're gonna you do things in life, whether that's personally or professionally. Yeah, that's fantastic. And hopefully we uh, get a lot of advice for you, for our students, you know, when they are about to make some critical decisions, right? And the first time of trying something. So I'd love to dive into this, you know, throughout this podcast. Um, sure, sure. I love the quote, life is like a box of chocolate and you never know what you'll get. So <laughs> for example, <laughs> I joined Apple in 2005 and met you as the VP of the iPod division. And you then left Apple in 2010 and founded the Nest. When our paths crossed again in 2014, you, we were at Google. Right. And a few years later, we both quit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm grateful to have worked for Apple and Google and dedicated my career to life-changing products. But if you asked the five-year-old me what I want to do when I grew up, teaching came up more often than other answers. So a few years ago, I began teaching at UC San Diego as my way to give back and also doing it as a passion, not a job. This is why a good amount of our audience are college students and young professionals. So students attend university to learn, grow, and maximize their potential. But guess what? One of the most pressing and the most popular questions is what skill should they learn? So I try to guide them to think about the mm -hmm. balance between hard skills and soft skills. Hard skills are objective mm -hmm. and they refer to technical knowledges, usually measured with a test, such as math, computer programming, and writing. Right. Uh, in contrast, soft skills are subjective and are hard to quantify, such as problem solving capabilities, creativity, communication, and leadership skills. Right. So Tony, you said in your book, everyone deserves a mentor. Mm -hmm. And the first two parts of your book are called build yourself and build your career. So I am curious, what advice would you give to our students? In other words, what essential and specific skills should they acquire for them to compete in today's job market? Mm -hmm. And uh, let's start with hard skills. Well, hard skills, well, on the hard skills front, you know, you always have to be learning. So even if you get out of school, you're still learning. Because if you're not learning and you're not staying cut, cutting edge on hard skills, whether that's engineering details or other kinds of doing what you do details or the latest of that, whatever that is in the, the industry you're in, you're going to fall behind. So you need to always keep learning about the latest because the technology and the tools you use to create the technology are changing constantly and they're changing faster than ever. So, you know, when you get out of school, you're still learning and you have to be learning. If not, you're gonna be obsolesced. So whatever the hard skills are that you need, you, you just have to understand that you're always gonna need new ones. There's, and you're gonna replace, and you're gonna, you know, there's experiences you have that you can inform you on for future things, but you should not, just have stasis and take things for granted that things aren't changing. Oh, I've learned the latest and therefore it is. It's faster than ever, changing faster than ever. So on the hard skills, it's just remembering to learn, continue to learn and be in touch and be curious about things that are just adjacent or things that might affect your, your um, expertise over time. Now on the soft skill side, that's what you're not taught in school, for the most part, unless you have some project-based learning or something like that. You don't have a soft skills. I think of it this way. You know, people always ask me, are you worried about AI taking the jobs of everyone? 
and I'm not. Because at the end of the day, the scoff skills, I don't care how, how much the technology advances, it will never have the soft skills. And it takes teams of people and really good leaders and engineers and designers and um, operations, all kinds of different salespeople, they have to understand the soft skills. Soft skills are learned by doing and there are some cl classes you can take, you know, it turns it sort of into hard skill, but everyone has to understand that the soft skills are really, besides understanding them, you, the soft skills that you project are really tailored to you, you personalize them because everybody has their own personality. So there's no one right way to do, um, like to do an equation or to solve an equation. Usually there's just a few ways to do it. When it comes to soft skills, there's so many different ways of, of the, having the same outcome, of uh, getting a, you know, a stronger team or motivating people or what have you, that you have to tailor those things and you can only tailor them by doing them, right? Mm -hmm. And then and learning a little bit, um, but you have to practice. It's a lot of practice and learning by doing to be able to get the soft skills. And you need to have more and more soft skills when you do more and more disruptive technology. And the reason for, for that is because you're changing the way the world is going to work. When you're a disruptor, you're changing the status quo. Mm -hmm. And to change the status quo, it's not because the best, best technology survives and thrives. That's not usually the case. It's the people who have the best marketing and storytelling and sales and all the other operational details, which all mean the team and how you lead the team or how you're part of the team and how everybody's aligned. That separates the, the great companies from just the, wow, that's an interesting idea, but they, didn't, they weren't really successful. So you gotta have the great technical skills and, and hard skills, but you have to have a lot of soft skills, the bigger uh, disruption you have that you're working with. Yeah, that's beautiful because I think it's always hard for you know, college students to understand how important the soft skills are. And then it's even harder to describe what exactly what we mean, you know, what type of skills you are. So you just put in a beautiful way. Um, and, that, and that's the reason for build, yeah. right? Build was all those things you don't learn in school that you learn through mentors that you learn, you know, in real time and, and the stories behind it. Because build's not about like, we took this, you know, semiconductor and put this software, it has nothing to do with Build, that was the funny thing is when I got done with build, you know, it had nothing to do with how to build things. It had to, how, how to build teams and build yourself and get people on the same track and just make decisions, which was really interesting for me, you know, when, when it was done. And then, um, and uh, I was delighted actually, in a way, because it, it can work, build works for so many different people in so many different industries and so many different professions. It's not just how do I make gadgets for for people to use, you know, by any, by no stretch of the imagination, so. Yeah, I think until I read your book, I would agree with you because if I say, well, you know, if I think about Tony Fadell is gonna write a book and name the build, I think I would be more leaning towards to, okay, it may be just about how to build a product, how to build a company. But when I start reading it, it was so interesting. And it's almost like building a unique life path, right? And then, you know, Tony, up to this point, it, what are some of the learnings and mostly related to people and the relationship and all of that. So that was very, very unexpected, but also powerful. Yeah, thank you. It, it was also, I was trying to use it as a Trojan horse. A lot of people are going to want to read it to learn like what were all the really key technical <laughs> details behind it. And then all of a sudden they get the trap is sprung and they got hooked in and they're like, what is this book about? You know, it's so- But they you know, cannot it, stop because they- And then they can't stop reading, reading it because they understand the products that they use every day and a little bit behind them, right? But uh, but at the end of the day, you have to understand it's the people, yeah. right? That's that's how these come to, to life is the people. And it's the soft skills, as you know, you know? Mm -hmm. So this is very interesting because I think when you were writing the book and uh, the school asked me to teach something, you know, and then I actually uh, picked emotional intelligence, oh, wow, which good. is a hundred percent soft skill class. 
And right. I think school could do better uh, in terms of teaching soft skills. It's very, very hard to teach, but we can always give a try, you know, especially with college students. I think there are, if you're thinking about graduate students, if you're thinking about executive MBAs, right? They have had some, you know, years of experience and now it's a time for them to uh, grow further, you know, beyond mm -hmm. the hard skill they have already acquired. I, I think that the best the best students that we hire or the best new grads that we hire, whether that's undergraduate or graduate, are the ones that had really um, intense internships, mm. where they actually went to work for one or two semesters each school year, where they actually had to start going, wait a second, when they start to apply the thing, their learnings, and then they have to deal with the politics in the workforce and the, you know, how do I get questions answered and how do, how do, how, how are people processes, you know, and processes to do all that stuff. Then the real questions come up and then you can actually understand why you need to learn the soft skills, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you always have to do before you learn. Is, that's what I think. You have to, whether that's technically or soft skills, you need to be able to, you have to do first so then you can realize why you need to learn. Yeah. I also wanted to go back to the hard skills a little bit, because if you're thinking about it, the younger version of ourselves, right, back then, is very different. And I think you talked about it, you know, you got the, the, the first computer uh, when you were like age eight, eight or nine, right? But these days, right, does this generation grow up with the internet, with computer? And then moving forward also, uh, you know, the, the whole digitalization uh, trend and all that. I'm just curious about any advice you would give it to our students, like some of the skills that may not be essential in the past, but now moving forward, especially when they're in school, utilize that opportunity to acquire all of those great ones. Yeah, without a doubt, you know, you have to have digital literacy. But I think that, you know, and, and that's the great thing when you're going to school, you realize this, uh, you know, that the world is just, the things that we see around us are all built by humans, right? They didn't come magically from some alien planet, you know, aliens dropped it in, we created it. So, and you're a human. So if you put in the time and the energy and you have the right team and people around you, you can do these things too. So when you, you know, when people use the tools like an iPhone, I got to grow up into an iPhone, right? And build one. But you can learn how to build iPhones or all the guts of iPhones or other products around you by just tinkering with them. And that gets you in the bug because, and then you learn, oh, these are just humans building this thing. And I can learn about this stuff too. Very different on the biology side. There's millions of years of evolution and we're still reverse engineering and we're not even close on biology. But when it comes to hard skills like processes and engineering and sales and all these different things, you can learn all that stuff um, um, really well. And 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 so for me, I just I think about uh, you know the the empowerment you get from being able to take things apart and put things back together and just know you're just going to be another you know chapter standing on the shoulders of all of these other people who created technology and you're standing on top of them and somebody will stand on top of you and it can be done it's been shown by for decades and centuries now that that happens and so don't be don't be scared feel empowered because you're a human and you have the same education and 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 go for it yeah that's wonderful